I'm a Reverend Bill McDonald, and uh, I live in uh, Northern California uh, by Sacramento, which is the capital, and uh, pretty much been grown up in this area. I was in San Francisco where I was born, and, and then I lived for a while in Oregon. And then uh, after high school, I left the Bay Area and took my surfboard and went to Hawaii like every young man does. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, now I'm back in California after serving in the military and living a life. And believe it or not, uh, I'm 77 years old and uh, I'm still out here and I'm more active now than I was 30, 40 years ago. And I've been through a lot lately and, uh, and I'm still kicking. So I wake up each morning and I go, hey, it's another day. Ooh, a gift. So I try to enjoy it. Uh, I look at every experience I have as not just for myself, but what have I learned for that I can share with others? I spent a month in India, in the foothills, and south, and the north. I was in Mumbai, and, uh, Delhi, and I was up in the foothills in uh, Lucknow, and then I was down in the south area, in Chennai, and some other places. I went to Qatar, you know, where they had the world uh, the World Cup for soccer, and. Uh, and then I've been all over California and Salt Lake City, Utah, the United States doing talks. Just starting to get re-engaged again after this long layoff because of COVID. And uh, it's it's time to get out there and share. The, I found that the world is hungry for messages of hope. When you turn on television, ah, between Ukraine, the Ukraine and Russia, what's happening in Israel, what's happening in Africa, what's happening in Washington, D.C., good God. And uh, wherever you go, there's turmoil, there's shooting, there's blood, there's violence. People are losing hope. People are, are fighting this darkness when, in truth, you're surrounded by light. There is no darkness in your own heart. And it may be around you out there. But if you choose to live this more heart-centered life, then you'll find that uh, it's it's more enjoyable. So that's what I'm doing. I'm going out and I'm talking. And uh, so I started life off in San Francisco Bay Area. And when I was uh, eight and a half years old, I got really, really, really sick. Um, and my parents were neglectful and they didn't, you know, bring me to a doctor or nothing. And I kept getting sicker and going to school to finally the school sent me home and said, Hey, this kid's too sick to go to school. I had a kidney disease and uh, I had mumps on both, both sides. I had pneumonia, in both lungs. I, I was anemic. I had all kinds of other issues, strep throat, everything. When you get the mumps as a kid, if you're not treated right, it just cascades, you know, and then pretty soon you're, your whole body's sick. So my whole body was sick, lungs, everything, kidneys, everything. And so when I was taken to the hospital, the county hospital, finally, uh, basically I was made a, like a ward of the, of, of the county. I was basically kind of like, okay, we got them. Bye. And my, my parents left. And uh, so at eight and a half years old, I was strapped into a gurney and taken to an isolation ward. And then they pulled fluids out of my lungs and everything. My first night away from home ever in my life, and I'm all alone in a hospital in the 19, early 50s. So I'm rolled down the hall, I'm rolled out to this isolation ward, and and then they puncture my lungs and pull fluids out. And, and then they just left me there and said, there's a bed, get in it. Uh, eight and a half years old, nobody's holding my hand, uh, no nursemaid, no nothing just boom there you go and i'm laying in bed and the lights are off and it's pitch black it's dark and all of a sudden i'm feeling weightless like there's no weight in my body i'm feeling i went from this cruciating pain and hard to believe to a lightness literally meaning light and weightless so i call it lightness and uh and i find myself hovering, floating, whatever word you want to use, above the, the my body. And I'm looking down at it thinking, man, that's a poor body. <laughs> I'm just glad I'm not the body. And I'm looking at that and pretty soon the room starts to become illuminated. It was light. 
clouds. Uh, it was fluffy, you know, it was kind of like, like you were floating in a cloud. And I felt very, very much loved and at peace. When I say loved, I mean, we're talking like, let's, let's say, because I had an Italian grandmother, right? Let's say you had a million Italian grandmas, you know, all pinching your cheeks and giving you a hug and going, ah, and, you know, that kind of love for like about a million of them. You felt embraced by the universe. You had built, you were literally embraced by the light that was around you. And it was regenerating in a, in a spiritual way. Physically, the body was gone. But in a spiritual way, it was like, like vitamin S, vitamin spirit, you know, love. You know, it was just beautiful. And I'm feeling very, very uh, much at peace. And, and then pretty soon, I had something different. I had a life preview that went from age eight and a half to 58 and a half, as it turns out, about 50 years in advance. I saw where I was going to live. I saw myself in a war in helicopters flying around, you know, and you got to realize in early 1950s, nobody knew what a Huey helicopter was, but let alone what it looked like. It was just being on the drawing boards and there was a war going on that I was a part of. I could tell it was in, an Asian country, uh, but I didn't know much about it. But I saw myself there sitting behind a machine gun and a helicopter. And I saw events and things unfolding that I knew as I was watching them, that I was watching my future self, that that is something that's going to happen to me. Saw the woman that uh, I married as a child. We met when we were 14. I met her and I, I, I knew who she was. And, and we dated in high school, and I knew I was going to marry her. Uh, and I saw my children. I saw some other strange things. I saw assassination of President John F. Kennedy. But when I'm eight and a half years old, I didn't know who John F. Kennedy was. He, he was certainly not a president or a national, you know, presence in anybody's life uh, um, in California. So, but I had this vision of this presidential guy driving down the streets of Dallas. And, and in my vision, there was more than one assassin. I, so I'm probably wrong about this because the government tells me I'm wrong. <laughs> but, uh, but there was more than one person shooting at Kennedy. So anyway, so be it as it may, I don't want to dwell on that. That's another whole, whole issue. But I saw that and I saw other life events, where I was going to work, where I was going to live, who I was going to meet. So there was two things to get on that. I'm watching that and realizing that, oh, obviously I got to go back. <laughs> this is not over. Uh, if you have a review going forward, that means you have something to go forward to. So at that point in time, I realized that uh, I wasn't going to be allowed to be stay in this nice puffy cloud and feeling good that I had to go back to that body that was laying on the, on the, on the bed below me, which I felt sorry for because that body was sick. And that body ended up being in the hospital a year, one year, which is a long time to be on total best bed rest, isolated from most people and no toys, no television, no phone, no coloring books, no books to read, nada. I had visitors uh, about once a week for about 10, 15 minutes. And that was it pretty much on my own every day. I would be woken up when they changed the shift, the nurses and uh, at six o'clock in the morning, uh, you know, they bring you your food, you change the sheets, but I ain't going anywhere. So my whole life at that age changed. I became bedridden and Probably this is going to sound crazy, but it was probably one of the best things that ever happened because I had absolutely no place to go, nothing to do. It could be boring as heck. That's when I chose to really learn about myself and to meditate <clears throat> in my own way and to uh, use my imagination and visualization. And I took these wonderful, beautiful journeys in my mind and stuff. I, I learned a lot of things about being still and being quiet. Uh, I'm a very patient man. 
Uh, I can wait for hours, days for something to happen. I, my patience level is, is just phenomenal. Anyway, so I came back to my body, endured the pain and the suffering of all that for the rest of the time. When I got out about a year, I was home and I had a dog and uh, the dog got run over by a car, you know, in front of my house and it was flattened basically. The tongue was hanging out, there's blood coming on the eyes, the nose, the ears, the, you know, the mouth and everything. And, and I loved that dog so much, I brought it in and I just used my love and energy and things I teach now as I go around the country teaching self-healing, but I, I don't want to dwell on that here, just to touch on the fact that this was the time I took the opportunity to use this energy that I felt inside myself. And, and I, it was kind of like giving the dog, uh, you know, those two paddles, you know, clear, you know, defibrillator. <laughs> I put my hands on this dog and boom, it jumped up, ran around, lived another eight, about another eight years of life. And uh, like nothing had happened to it. So there was a, there was something that happened to me during that near death experience. I came back and, and love was really a, a powerful thing in my life. Love, forgiveness, uh, energy, all these things that I learned from that time that I was, I spent in the hospital. And while I was having that experience with the clouds and everything and looking at my life going forward, there was something odd that happened at the time. There was two numbers that kept flipping around. It was 29 and then the two would flip over and look like five. It was looked like 29, 59. And it kept, and I, at the time I had no clue what it meant. I thought in my mind, I go, well, maybe at 29 or 59, maybe uh, I'm going to be close to death again or something, you know? And then somebody tried to tell me, oh, no, that's your Saturn. You know, you go into these periods of Saturn changing every 29 and almost 59 years. You're, you're in a different astrology. Well, I'm not into that astrology and stuff, but the, the death thing sounded like, yeah, maybe I got to take care of myself. So when I came out of the hospital, I became a vegetarian, the only one in my family. I knew I had to do something. I, I came back knowing that I got to do something to change my body because my body was prone to have some issues. And I, and I knew if I started uh, eating right, don't do drugs, don't do alcohol, don't do caffeine, don't do nicotine, don't do any of these things and, and take proper care of myself that I would handle that. And as it turned out, that's exactly what I did. My second near death experience. I'm in India when this happened. And I'm actually finding my way up to Babaji's cave. I went to an ashram in India and talked to Swami and he gave me these instructions how to find the cave and there was nobody to take us up there. And I got lost going up there. And it was really an ordeal, a lot of things happened. And on the way back down, I had a heart attack. I was standing on a 30 foot cliff up the Himalayan mountains and just, <laughs> just fell off this cliff. Now, the good news is that it wasn't straight down. It went about every 10 feet or so. There was just like a little ledge or a little sloping coming out. So I fell down, hit about 10 feet, then fell another 10 feet and fell another 10 feet. And I ended up on this boulder, this big rock on this big rock. And I'm laying there. I got no pulse. I'm not breathing. And I'm having that same feeling that I had when I was a child. I go, wait a minute. And I'm just starting to feel light and I'm lifting up pretty soon. I'm looking down at my body, laying on this boulder, looking up at the sky. And I realize, huh, okay, here we go. I'm dead, you know. I'm 58 and a half years old. Uh, this is just about the, this is the end of that predictions, right? So I'm thinking, oh, 58 and I'm almost 59. So 59, maybe this is my time to go, right? And I looked down and there was this giant cobra snake. I say giant, you know, I, I have no clue how big it was, but when you have a cobra crawling across your feet, <laughs> even if it's a dead body, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's a big, that's a big snake. And when I saw it, there was, instead of being frightful or, you know, excited, there was a great love for that snake. It was like, wow, I love that snake. And it was like, 
clear. It's like I got the paddles again. Boom. I, I My body jumps up on the rock and boom, my, my spirit is back inside this body and it's heavy. But I find myself grabbing this wild, wild <laughs> cobra, trying to grab it around the, I'm grabbing like this around the body of this thing and my fingers are not touching. They're like this and the body is, you know, here. I can't touch my fingers or my thumbs. So it's a fat snake, right? And, and then the head was up, you know, they had that cobra hood and it just, just keeps slithering. And I keep trying to grab it and I'm chasing it through the grass with my sandals on and, and I'm chasing, I'm grabbing on this thing, annoying the heck out of it. And it just keeps running from me. And it finally goes behind this little waterfall. There's a little trickle of the water down a rock and it crawls back in there and it just hoods up and it looks at me, you know, like, you know, it really woke me up and I realized, wow, what an experience. There was something about going to the, that special cave. There was something about dying there and then being brought back by a cobra. It felt very sacred, very special. So that was well, I was just a few months shy of 59. So what happened was typical man, as my wife would say, the normal reaction, because I was in India several months, at that point you think, well, when I get off this mountaintop, first thing I'm going to do is go to the doctor. Nope, not even the 10th thing I did. I, I continued to travel several more weeks, come back to California, and it wasn't until February. So I was, I had that cliff fall about October. So I had October, November, December, January. So it's like almost five months later, I finally go in the doctor because I'm collapsing in my garage. I think, well, you know, you collapse six times. That's probably not normal. That's probably not too good for the body. So I, um, I told my wife, I said, well, I'm going to, I'm going to drive to the, I'm going to go drive to the, the hospital. I'm going to get checked up. I'm not feeling good. Well, I'm having a full blown heart attack and I know it. And I get in my pickup truck with gear shifts and everything, you know, and I'm driving seven miles to the hospital and, and uh, I get to the ER and there's no parking. So I got to go park in another parking lot. And then I walk across that big parking lot. I get to ER. I don't go into the doors where the ambulance are at. I go into the, the ones where people walk in, they, you know, got pneumonia or something. I get in, I get in line. There's about 18 people in line in front of me. And, uh, finally get up to the front of the line and one question they ask, they don't ask what's wrong with you. How do you feel? First question they asked me was, do you have medical insurance? <laughs> I go, yeah, yeah. You know, so here's a clipboard, fill all this out and then bring it back. Go to that line over there, you know, over there where there's like eight people. So I fill this whole, I fill this whole time. I'm having a full blown heart attack but I'm acting just like I am right now. Totally calm, you know. And so I get in the other line. I get up there, I hand the clipboard to the lady there. She looks at the clipboard where it says, what's wrong? And I put down, I'm having a, a heart attack. She goes, she laughs. <laughs> she said, how'd you get here? And I said, I drove myself. She goes, yeah. And you parked out there. And I go, no, I parked the farther lot. You know, it's about a half mile away. <laughs> she goes, yeah, okay, fine. She says, I'll be the judge of this heart attack. You sit down. She takes out her stethoscope, pushes it on my heart. Next thing you know, she's pushing a button. There's lights going. Next thing you know, somebody's coming with a gurney. She goes, sir, sir, you're having a heart attack. And I said, yeah, yeah, I know that. That's why I came in. <clears throat> That's what I'm telling you. She says, no, no, you're really having a heart attack. And I go, yeah, I know. So they roll me in there and they bring the doctor in and he wants to do surgery. He wants to do all these crazy things right away. And I said, sir, you're having a heart attack. And then so... I'm looking at him and I'm saying, you know, this don't make a lot of sense. I said, you know, uh, I've been a vegetarian since I was eight, nine years old. Uh, I, I don't drink coffee. I don't drink tea. Uh, I don't do booze. I don't do drugs of any kind. Uh, exercise. I meditate. What gives? You know, what, you know, and all of a sudden now I'm having a heart attack. And he looks at me and I remember the 2959, right? And I'm just getting ready to be 59 in a few days. And he looks at me and he goes, he says, well, you know, actually with your DNA makeup and your medical history, he says, 
I'm surprised you didn't die at 29. I said, had you not changed your habits at an earlier age, or, or you know, I hadn't done that when you, when as a child, he says, you probably would have been dead at 29 years old instead of being almost 59. So then it goes, oh, 29, 59. By me listening to my intuition when I get out of the hospital, I prevented those those two events. See? So now I'm thinking, well, 59, this ain't over yet. I'm going to be 59 in days, right? So I'm going, this is February, my birthday's in March. I go, no, I'm just days away, right? And here's how this works, because I don't know, I'm not much into astrology, but I had a friend who was born the same day in San Francisco, same hospital as I was. We shared a room together as babies, you know, like the, next to each other. Our parents were next to each other. And so his name was Paul. And Paul drank, smoked, gambled, ate meat, did all the crazy stuff, right? Drugs, everything. And I found out just a few months before he had died. He didn't make 59. He died. I found out when I was talking to reunion people at my high school. Oh, no, he, he's dead. He, he's, he's not going to make it. So I'm thinking, same time, just an hour or so difference in the birth time, same place. And see, for that astrology, if you believe in astrology, you go, wait a minute, you know, they're both kind of born under the same star system. And the one died at about just before you're 59, and the other guy didn't become close, right? So only difference being I listened to my inner voice and gave up all that stuff and didn't go down that road. People got this idea that you have to have a near-death experience to have a spiritual experience. No. And having a near-death experience is not the best way to have a spiritual experience. Certainly, you don't want to have to practically die to find some something. And when you have a near-death experience, just because you've had a near-death experience, you've tasted it and you've seen there's still consciousness and life on the other side and great love, doesn't make you enlightened. You still have a lot to learn. You get a peek, though, at the truth that love never dies, that everything is about love and forgiveness. And when you leave this body of flesh, that's the only thing you've left. You've left the material world and this body of flesh, but you haven't really gone anywhere. You're still the consciousness, the spirit, the soul, you're still you. You still have that, what I call an I-ness. You have a, a history, a personal history. You're still continuing it. You're still a part of the great connection with the one. So treat your body well. Enjoy every day you wake up. You never know when your time to expire comes. So I found... Every day is a gift. And every day you have an opportunity to give, to love, to serve. You can't build a dam for your love and just only, you know, it stops here. Only family, only this, only my country, only my race. No, it has to flow. True spiritual health is allowing the love to flow to all the places to everyone, to puppies, to kittens, to children, you know, to, to Europe, to Africa, to Asia, it doesn't matter, to your neighbor's house. You don't stop it. It's about love. And, and you don't have to be someplace to love. Love from where you're at. You don't have to go around telling people I love you. That's just love in here. They will know they're being loved. Pray for people. Don't tell them you're praying for them. Just pray for people. You know, pray. And your enemies should be the people that you're praying for. And enemies are the ones that you should be spending your time really loving. They need love more than anyone else. So that's the lesson of Vindy Ease.